my name is Kathy Lauer. I run the Elixir Industry Program. And if you've never heard of Elixir before, we are an intergovernmental organization. What does that mean? So we are an umbrella organization and have hundreds of academic um, bioinformatics institutes under our umbrella. They are coordinated through 23 nodes and you can see we are set up all across Europe. Um, and our central coordination unit is based here in Cambridge on the Wellcome Genome Campus. So Elixir um, is set up around five areas of activity, we call them platforms. So these are technical areas, um, this could be compute, um, data, interoperability services, software and tools or training. And then we apply those activity areas in scientific fields. So we call those scientific areas communities. So this could be um, workflows such as Galaxy, this could be uh, marine metagenomics, rare disease proteomics, as you can see, we cover um, a large, uh, uh, we, we cover a, a, a large um, variety of the life science sector. And um, as an organization, despite um, mainly being made up of academic institutes, it is um, also part of our job to engage with the private sector. Um, and therefore we have certain activities such as this Elixir Bioinformatics Industry Forum really to bring everyone around the table and discuss, for example, bottlenecks where we need to work together to move science forward. And just um, to make you aware of a couple of those upcoming opportunities for knowledge exchange, for networking, so we will have another um, virtual event in the Bioinformatics Industry Forum online series on using open software tools and AI to improve bioimaging on the 23rd of June. We will have um, our first face-to-face -face event in uh, more than over a year in Basel together with the um, Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. The topic is on building the learning ecosystem of health from data tracking to preventive medicine. And um, the registration for the event is open. The event is free to attend and um, our next in-person event hopefully in person will be um, a bio hackathon we've been running the bio hackathon now um, I think the third fourth fourth year um, and this one will be held in Barcelona and um, if you're interested in finding out what the bio hackathon is all about or how to participate um, please visit the website Okay, so this is the very last thing um, as part of our engagement program, where one of our kind of main pillars is to make sure that scientists know how to manage their research data. And um, the Elixir community has put together a research data management kit um, that supports fair by design and they are still taking input from external partners and of course encouraging the use of that research data management kit so if that is something that is of interest to you please have a look um, and see if that is um, for you to contribute or use All right so um the last thing from my side before i hand over to annalisa and to hatim is um, we've set up a go to uh, a menti.com. So if you get to menti.com, please type in um, that code that you can see on the screen. Um, and it would be great if you could answer some of those questions. We will make use of them in the following panel session. Okay, so this is everything from my side. And um, now I'm handing over to Annalisa and to Hatim. Um, they both come from Google Cloud. And um, I guess you, yeah, you've, you're, already, you're already sharing your screen, fabulous. I'll just hand over to you and, and yeah, take it from there. Thank you very much for coming. Great, thank you. Um, so you guys can see my screen okay? Okay, so just give me a shout if something comes up. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, um, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much for letting us speak to you. Um, we're gonna kind of give this dual presentation. I come from Google Research with a strong research background and Hatim comes from 
um, kind of the information technology side. So we're gonna merge these two things together because that's kind of what's required for the next frontier for multi-omics uh, work. So just a brief outline, we're gonna do an introduction, kind of what cloud is currently doing for life sciences, um, what we're doing actually in Google research in the multi-omic space, and then give some examples of the cloud architectures you would need to be able to analyze uh, these types of data sets, alternatives to sequencing for your type of data flowing in, how to automate your laboratory and take any questions. Um, and I'll try to check back and forth with the chat, but um, if we if we don't get to your questions during the presentation, we'll try to capture them all at the end. So, um, okay. So my background is actually um, in research. So I came from a physics background. I did some nanotechnology work back in the US. Um, I did my PhD at the intersection of physics and mathematical models and building novel technologies in the single molecule RNA space to do single RNA detection in single cells um, in mammalian systems. And then I transitioned to my postdoc where I started doing single protein detection. So live cell imaging, individual protein molecules um, binding to either DNA or other proteins um, and building mathematicals around that, mathematical models around that. And then actually I was recruited to Google and built a research laboratory um, that I ran for about four or five years working uh, in the protein sequencing space. So I'll tell you a little bit about one of the research projects that we did. Um, but all of these, all of these tools have had a similar theme that in order to be able to build better predictive models, uh, for biology, we've needed to increase the capabilities and resolutions of different types of experiments. And so as we make better assays, then the, the algorithms actually get more complex and, and it creates a really interesting space for finding biological mechanisms. So hopefully most folks here understand the central dogma of molecular biology, um, but our DNA is uh, converted into RNA, which is then translated into proteins. Um, one of the reasons why technologies in the DNA and RNA space have advanced uh, much faster than in the protein space for in terms of sequencing and linking all these things together is because you can replicate DNA, you can convert RNA back into DNA and replicate it. And so the technologies don't require this single molecule um, capabilities that maybe you would need for protein. And then you would need to be able to convert protein potentially into something else, something that you could replicate if you wanted to get above the signal to noise that you would need for a high throughput robust assay. So um, in terms of what's available, sequencing is conventionally used for both DNA and now RNA. Um, so single cell sequencing and then for protein, there's a variety of different things that are conventionally being used like mass spec or ELISA and also a lot of new technologies that are coming up. And I'll talk to you about our contributions to this space a little later in the talk. Um, but what's really interesting is as you look at multiomics is that you transition in terms of molecule complexity dramatically from the genome to the proteome. Um, and, and multi-omics is, you know, there's metabolomics and, and there's a lot of other omixes that we can consider as well. Um, but just in this more simplified example, you know, if we're just considering one isoform from a protein encoding gene, then the proteomic space is maybe 20,000, I think it's like 20,350 molecules. But if you're considering all the different isoforms, how they could be modified, post-translational modifications, et cetera, the proteomic space is still yet to be fully defined, um, but it can be somewhere between, you know, hundreds of thousands to maybe even putatively hundreds of millions of different variants. And so um, the sequencing uh, capabilities kind of decrease as we transition from left to right, but the mo molecular diversity increases. And so it makes this really fascinating problem um, that I think, you know, currently now in the next couple of years is, is going to be a really interesting space to work in. Um, if you're asking yourselves, why protein? Why can't we just use conventional DNA sequencing to kind of predict the different cell states? Each one of your cells is expressing a different proteome uh, at any given point in time. And so if you imagine that your cell is a machine, your DNA is your source code, your RNA is your active code, and the protein is giving you the state of the system. And as these new methods are coming online, um, we're able to see more and more into that state. And then the algorithms that we're able to run and the predictive modeling we're able to do becomes extremely interesting because now that we have a better vision of what that picture looks like, um, we can kind of understand a little bit more of what's happening. Um, okay. So we're gonna transition, Hatem's gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing in cloud for the life sciences. 
Thanks, Annalisa. <clears throat> As Annalisa mentioned, I kind of come from the other side of the equation. So I've, um, I'm a computer science by uh, education and uh, I've been at Google for almost 10 years. And I spent the past four years working with Google Cloud, focusing on higher education and research. So working with um, researchers and with a focus on life sciences and genomics. So if we look at how the cloud model fits life sciences, and it's been something that um, really amazed me in the past few years, working with different research projects. Um, lots of the research we do has slightly different nature in terms of the spiky demand that um, we sometimes need uh, very few infrastructure to scaling to thousands of cores to do a GWAS study, for example, and then scaling back to zero when we're done. Um, the need for different types of machine, custom machine types, different memory, different computes, different types of processors, um, and that all um, um, it can be met with cloud. In addition to specialized hardware, if you're doing uh, single cell imaging, for example, or working with cryo-EM or microscopy, then you might need a different type of GPUs, a different type of machine. The other thing is also how um, we can scale with storage, how we can uh, store petabytes of data on cloud quite easily and actually access this storage quite quickly. And then also combine that with the public data sets that are available to cloud. And there is lots of public data set um, that Google hosts or other organizations like the NIH um, or others host on uh, Google Cloud and other clouds that really makes it easy when you're working on cloud to combine these different data sets and these different data sources. There are also an element of economics. So um, options like using preemptable VMs, uh, some of the workloads, you can actually uh, take advantage of this type of machines um, that are a lot cheaper. Um, I, they can be preempted, you can lose some of the processing, but then you can recover quite quickly. And then finally, when you're working on cloud, you can actually um, design your infrastructure, all of it as code. So you can use uh, tool chains to actually build a whole cluster or a whole setup and tear it down in just minutes. This makes this a lot less uh, manual labor, more secure, but also um, it allows you to make your work a lot more repeatable. So what this means is you can actually share your whole setup to someone else and someone can deploy an identical setup and run the same experiment as needed. So if we move to the next slide, then why Google Cloud uh, a little bit in specific. So I did mention the flexible and optimized pricing. So you can actually have more predictability in terms of the cost. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, the economics of doing this type of research on, on cloud um, later. It's also, uh, we have industry leading security in terms of everything is encrypted by default on, on Google Cloud, both um, um, uh, at rest and in transit. We have lots of tools that enables you to uh, set up a compliant environment that could be HIPAA compliant. We publish lots of guidelines and scripts to help you uh, build a secure environment for research. There's also a growing ecosystem of partners and workflow engines that um, take advantage of the APIs we've built on Google Cloud. And we've, um, our focus on life sciences extend beyond just providing um, 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 VMs and infrastructure, but we actually provide very specific APIs that are built to support the um, uh, workloads in life sciences in healthcare, such as the healthcare API, the life sciences API, and we're going to talk a little bit about both. Finally, access to um, uh, key industry data sets. So um, looking at some of the uh, data sets, for example, published by the Broad, um, that includes the Nomad um, 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 or the 1000 genomes, lots of reference genomes, there's lots of existing data sets that are on cloud that can be accessed and not just public access data sets like this, but also other controlled access data like the TCGA and others that are available. So if we look at um, the toolbox, uh, as I call it, the next slide, um, um, kind of the bioinformatician toolbox on Google Cloud, there's lots and lots of tools that enables you to do different types of, uh, of processing and deal with different types of data. So um, as an example, Dataproc is our managed Hadoop and tools like Hail can easily be deployed with just a couple of lines. You can have um, a Hadoop cluster. And as I said, you can easily tear that down when not needed. Workflow engines like Cromwell, Nextflow or SnakeMate, they all take advantage of the life sciences API. So you can run your workload to scale. And we've seen examples of organizations, for example, um, using Cromwell to run 
uh, large scale GWAS, scaling up to 100,000 cores on Google Cloud and completing the research quite quickly. But then there are other tools and um, that we've developed. So as I said, we are not just providing infrastructure, but we also care about how people can manipulate different types of data. So Variant Transform is an example of one of these tools that we developed to enable you to take variant data from VCF files and put it in BigQuery. And this is um, a key step because one of the most laborious works is actually how can you put your data in a format that can be accessed with um, common machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch. And Variant Transform with BigQuery does just that. It enables you to transform the variant data into a tabular format in BigQuery and access it quite quickly and in a quite scalable and economical manner. Finally, there is lots of, um, 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 there's lots of need for simply just compute. So infrastructure as a service. So you just need your um, uh, virtual machines, your uh, storage, your networking. So you can run tools like Slurm or Grid Engine or Galaxy um, or other tools that just you need to uh, simply run your uh, batch analysis or other types of analysis. In addition to that, we work, um, uh, we've been working with Verily and, and, and the Broad Institute, for example, on Terra, which is, provides a workbench. And it's a tool that enables sharing notebooks, sharing pipelines, and accessing lots of data sets uh, quite easily. And of course, many more. So um, looking at some of the challenges, one thing that we've noticed when working with lots of um, researchers that data ingestion is actually a key challenge. It is quite often uh, laborious. Some of the uh, uh, um, um, tools that you use would not support uploading directly to, to cloud. You need to make sure that you're keeping track of the generated files and derivatives, and also uh, the, the provenance of the data, how it was generated, linking it to the samples. And finally, automating lots of the pre-processing, which can take lots of time um, from the lab team, time that can be used and well spent in, in, in doing other things. So how can we actually get our data to cloud. So um, next slide. So my advice is, well, crawl, walk, run, and avoid going from zero to here. One, one common mistake I see is um, some labs that are already established and they have a process, lots of it is manual. They, they, they try to automate everything at once. And while automation is great, but we have to look at low hanging fruits. What can we automate today that's going to save us lots of time and also um, help the work at the lab? So um, cloud lens itself, because it includes lots of tools for automation. And it's actually one of the key concepts when you're architecting uh, a solution for cloud is how can you automate it? How can you reduce um, the manual labor and the toil needed to do something? So if we look in the next slide, at a simple architecture that we've uh, we've worked on with actually multiple labs. So this looks very simil similar to um, the setup that we've done before. So having a sequencer or a microscope as a source of data, um, you can simply use any of the existing tools. So there are tools that are built into Google Cloud like GSUtil or data transfer tools, in addition to lots of third party tools. Um, and you can use that to simply move the raw data from um, 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 your device, your microscope, your machine to Google Cloud Storage. Once you have your data there, then you move to um, um, a kind of an event-driven architecture. You can use triggers such as adding a new file to the Google Cloud Storage to trigger a workflow uh, in a workflow engine, for example, that can use the Life Sciences API. Once um, the data is, is written out, you can also verify that the data is there and you can use a database um, like a simple cloud SQL to uh, keep track of the files, uh, what pipelines they have, um, 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 what type of analysis have been run on these files, um, Docker images that have been used and keep that all in a simple automated um, uh, event driven mechanism. And PopSub and Cloud Functions are two tools that are available on cloud that can enable you with very little coding to actually achieve a huge degree of automation for a lab. And, and Annalisa would show an example of how she did that in her lab um, later in, in, in the presentation. So um, if we talk about the cloud economics in the next slide a little bit. So I want to talk about understanding the value versus cost. Uh, a question that we get lots of times is how much this is going to cost exactly. And while we can 
in, in many cases work on um, creating a model that takes in, into account how many samples you're going to process, how much this is going to cost. We need to understand what are we actually providing to our stakeholders. It could be that, okay, we are doing this type of analysis on this type of files or this type of um, samples. Then the next thing we need to understand is how much does it cost me to provide that and only that thing. So if you're doing um, 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 processing of whole genome sequences and this is what you're doing and you're working with germline um, uh, pipeline, then uh, this is what you're doing. And the cost is how much does it cost you to run this analysis on one sample? Then the next question is how can I optimize um, the spend per this sample. So it could be, um, all right, I'm going to um, uh, use a different type of VMs or I'm going to optimize part of the algorithm or I'm going to use GPUs instead of CPUs. You also need to, to understand again the value because um, do you want to do it as cheap as possible or do you want to do it as quick as possible? There are usually often different answers. So understanding what is the real value you're providing and then how can you look at the unit and then how can you optimize the cost for this unit? And this, this is actually quite useful. Um, um, if we look at the next example and what the Broad did. So um, when the Broad Institute first moved to Google Cloud, their best practice analysis pipeline, um, um, JATK, uh, it cost around $45 per 30X coverage genome. And then as they worked over a couple of years, the cost actually went down to just under $5 per genome. So as you can imagine, this had a huge effect on what they're doing, and not just in terms of cost reduction, but in terms of how do they actually budget their research. And again, this, this could be key for when you're trying to budget your uh, research, you're asking for a grant, how much is it to, going to cost exactly? So, all right, you can actually run tests and see how much does it cost per sample, and then this is how many samples I have, and turn this into a different type of equation because you no longer need to maintain a fixed infrastructure. You need, no longer need to pay upfront for everything that you're going to use for the next five years, but rather you can actually really try to zoom in on what are you doing to do? What's the cost per unit? And then how can you optimize that? And we have other examples um, of how to optimize. So if you go to the next slide, so this is actually how uh, the broad brought down the cost. Um, so. Um, this is what the first one looked like, and then, then this is some of the things they did. And we've done the same process, so we've taken the same process, and then we've worked with other researchers here in the UK and across Europe to actually reduce the cost. So, for example, one of the researchers we were work working with, they were running um, uh, CEREC on whole genome sequences, and once the first run um, was close to $100, but as we worked through the process, we actually managed to get to, all, to, to, to add 80% cost saving and reduce that to a lot less. And it was a mix of, well, first run, let's run as is. And then we started uh, optimizing the machine types we use. We started looking at um, uh, what intervals he was using um, uh, to, uh, to split the genome. And then how did that affect the storage? And we really did manage to bring the cost down significantly. So this is just one example of how we can uh, we can do that. So uh, back to you, Annalisa. Great. Um, thanks for that. So, I mean, as you're planning your experiments or budgeting for the year or putting your grants together, understanding the cost and being able to have a known sustainable cost is really important. So feel free to reach out to us. Google Cloud does things like subscription agreements, and we try to really work with research institutes to make things um, optimized for what they're trying to do, and then also just understandable uh, as things are moving forward. So in terms of research and multi-omics, so um, one of the projects I developed is called ProtSeq. It's a protein sequencing technology where we're trying to do high throughput de novo protein sequencing. So unlike situations where you're maybe comparing a protein molecule or a peptide back against a genomic sequence, um, we're trying to actually just understand each individual amino acid in a single molecule fashion. Um, and the reason for that is it allows us to explore, you know, protein fusions, modifications, um, also things like antibodies uh, and things like that, uh, foreign proteins in your body and things like that. So 
why why would we want to spend do something like this? This is kind of a different type of research project than Google typically takes on, but actually there's a lot of really interesting biotechnology work being done at the company. So one of the huge motivations is if you look at plasma proteomics. So if you're taking some of your blood, you're trying to see what proteins are circulating around um, your system. If, if you spin it down and look at the serum, most of the proteins that you're gonna see in terms of quantity um, are made up of of these 13, 14 proteins in the sample. And so what's really interesting biologically are proteins that are beneath kind of the floor that the sensitivity of something like mass spec could see. So that's on the order of maybe 10 to the fifth. Um, and so what researchers are really trying to do these days is come up with new technologies to be able to look at the cytokines and look at, look at proteins that we weren't able to see before. Um, because you lose a lot of interesting biomarker situations. Um, and so we tried, we developed a technology where we had a limited number of binders um, and we went through a certain number of cycles and I'll explain what we mean by cycles in just a moment um, to correctly resolve a certain percentage of the human proteome. And so from our simulations, we saw that we only needed a handful of binders. And if we looked at 12 cycles or 12 amino acids in a row, um, we could resolve a large percentage of the human proteome. Um, and so this really motivated us to see if we could do some of the things that Google was very good at, utilizing machine learning, automation, um, high throughput data analysis, um, running all our algorithms on cloud in combination with some interesting new techniques and approaches to mitigate this gap. And so I'm just gonna kind of outline the technology here. So we actually took a NGS sequencing chip. So if you're doing DNA sequencing, you know, just an Illumina sequencing chip, we started with the MySeq chip. We actually created a system where we could attach proteins or peptides to the chip. So there are DNA adapters or DNA sequences that are located on this chip. And then we built a system to develop a bunch of binders that bind to the N-terminal uh, amino acid. Uh, we actually went after dipeptides because we wanted to increase the signal to noise of each reading, but we built a bunch of probes. And these probes are made from DNA. They're called aptamers. So they're short strands of DNA that, that produce a certain sort of secondary structure that allows them to, to bind to different targets. And you have to evolve these DNA sequences. You start off with maybe 10 to the 14. You evolve it foot through several rounds. And we attached a DNA barcode to the end of our, our probes. We washed off things that didn't bind. And then we ligated or connected our DNA barcode to a neighboring adapter. And um, so what we're trying to do is transfer the information of which binder, so which dipeptide we're targeting, to a, to a neighboring uh, DNA adapter on the chip. Um, after we did that, we used a restriction enzyme to cleave off the aptamer. And then we also used a degradation method to cleave off the N-terminal amino acid from the protein that's there, exposing a new dipeptide that is now N-terminal. We repeated a binding round, we repeated the tagging. And so as we're chopping down our protein or peptide, we're replacing it with these DNA barcoded sequences. And the advantage of doing something like that is then you can amplify the signal. So we couldn't amplify the protein, but we can now amplify it because it's in DNA space. And so we do this amplification process. We reprogram the sequencers and we're able to sequence these DNA barcodes. After we get the DNA barcodes back, we then deconvolve which amino acids they're representing and then fit it to what proteins in the proteomic space. Um, so this work has several patents behind it. And there's actually a paper that is in submission right now. So hopefully soon you'll be able to read a little bit more detail about the work that we did in this space. Um, in order to kind of understand how many binders you would want to use for solving a type of problem like this, this is where mathematical models and simulations can be really useful. Of course, you know, they're, excuse me, more simplified, <clears throat> sorry, um, then, considering all of the experimental parameters that you have. So you can have errors in each one of these assays, right? Your ligation or restriction enzyme cleavage might not be 100% perfect. Or your binding, you can have K on, K offs, and you can have variable K on, K offs per binder. Um, but just taking a more simplistic view, you can resolve a large amount of the proteome with a few number of binders. And also your binders can be a bit promiscuous. So your binders, if you have known binding profiles to more than one dipeptide sequence. So if we're just considering unmodified dipeptide sequences, you're gonna have about 400 of them. Um, you can have a binder that maybe binds to seven, eight, nine of these different dipeptides. And it's still extremely informative. So that, that was a really promising thing that you didn't need to find 400 unique binders. You can get a lot of bits of information 
uh, out of less. Um, we also recently published a paper on incorporating machine learning for increasing the number of binder candidates. Um, so we use uh, machine learning on Aptimer sequences to explore and create a larger pool of putative binders. And then we combine that with internal experimental testing to see if it improved our situation and created more and better candidate outputs. And that paper is in Nature Communications that came out, I think, a few weeks ago. So that's something to, to read as well if you're interested. Um, and so once you have these barcodes, there's another really interesting computational problem here, which is if you have, you know, your simulation produces the best case scenario, and then maybe model Models can help you improve binders. And then the third class of problem is actually doing that proteomic fit right at the end, because you're stitching together these peptides into whole proteins. You may not have a perfect binder situation that your simulation says, you know, you might have something that maybe binds in a promiscuous way that you didn't initially to plan for because you created a different competition than um, you were exploring in your simulation. And so then we also developed algorithms um, basically trying to do these fits of proteins that were afterwards and comparing them to different controls. Um, so all in all, the technique was about looking at single cell, single molecule proteins, increasing the dynamic range of protein expression or protein capability for protein analysis, and then seeing if we can identify looking at post-translational modifications so we can truly explore the whole proteomic space. And so, you know, this is part of Google's research efforts in order to increase the capabilities in the multiomic space. So not just computationally by building better algorithms, but also how can we build up experiments to, to increase the the predictive capabilities of these algorithms. Okay, um, so I'll pass it back off for multiomics with Google Cloud. Okay, thank you, Elisa. So um, if you might have seen this um, architecture in some of our previous talks by Google Cloud, um, having just a sequencer. And it's, it's a very typical um, um, reference architecture. We would have the sequencer, then you upload the data, you can do your secondary analysis. And then um, um, you have the process data, and then this is when you start doing your tertiary analysis using notebooks um, and other tools. Um, but it's not just sequencers, actually. It could be any of, of the other um, tools. As I said, we've been working with researchers who are um, um, using cryo-EM or single cell imaging and combining different data modalities on Google Cloud using some of these tools. So if we look at the next slide, um, Again, this is a very common data processing architecture. As I mentioned before, in the toolbox uh, of biometricians, there are lots of workflow engines that we support um, that allows you to run your pipelines and take full advantage of the flexibility of Google Cloud, um, like Chromal, SnakeMake, um, Nextflow, and others. And um, it's more or less, you can actually take out the DNA sequencer and put on um, another um, um, uh, device and it would be the same. So if we look at the next slide, this is um, an architecture that we have de actually um, developed with a lab that was doing proteomics um, um, and um, they were using basically mass spec. So this is an example of how you can use um, ingest data into Google Cloud and again using PopSub and Cloud Function automate lots of the processes. So you can automate um, the pre-processing, you can automate the actually the calibration of, of devices and everything was eventually stored in a portal that allowed access to researchers so they can actually follow, um, follow the, uh, the progress of, of the experiment. So um, again, it, it, it's simply a matter of um, 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 finding the right tools for um, um, and write the right pipelines. And I think this is, this is um, developing as we speak. So we, we've in, in maybe in more in the genomics um, side, we've seen lots of the tools that are more established, but now we are seeing more, uh, more and more tools from single cell imaging and other types of uh, um, omics data with building tools specifically built for clouds. Um, back to you, Elise. Great. Um, so a lot of the stuff we've talked about so far has to do with your inputs being from a sequencer. And while that allows you to get this high throughput data, um, 
oftentimes if you're trying to do, let's say a single molecule assay, um, you know, you can create some more noise. RNA-seq has gotten better and better, um, but sometimes you want to use an approach where you're maybe combining things with imaging or maybe you want to use um, other technologies. And so these pipelines aren't constrained to just analyzing sequencing data. Um, so they're built in such a way where um, I kind of think of it like Legos, you're stitching together or maybe a, a train system, right? You're able to kind of stitch together these different pieces, um, but it's made with a flexibility where if your inputs potentially change or maybe a different type of analysis change, you can still keep a large portion of the pipeline as you're making these swaps. So a lot of uh, um, kind of multi-omics research in this space is depending on imaging data and, and pulling in um, reference images or calibrating them um, or looking with other data sets from different labs and different collaborations. And so the idea is to create something flexible and scalable and interchangeable so it can evolve with you as you're evolving your research. Um, and so one of the ways to do that is utilizing cloud AI notebooks. So this is something internally we, we call it CoLab and we use CoLab notebooks, um, but it's essentially very similar framework where you're able to write your Python code and, and produce plots and images in real time. Um, and you can run different sections of it. And what's nice is, um, so this is actually something we utilize very often um, in my laboratory, is it allows two things. One is it creates this really shareable, interchangeable platform where multiple people can join in and edit or see what's going on. And it also allows for experimentalists to kind of create and produce their own um, own graphs or, or their own types of analysis that they need. So we built it for multiple different systems. We would typically pull in our data onto the cloud. We would automatically trigger running what we called quick checks. Um, and these were ways for us to check to make sure kind of the sanity of the experiment. Do we want to invest the energy and resources to continue to, to look at this data at a deeper dive later on? Or is there something that went wrong? You know, were two samples potentially mixed together? Are we missing something? Is there, we would have like contamination checks because um, we did a lot of sequencing. Um, so, so building in these tools to automatically be run and be triggered and sent back to the scientist as soon as they're complete allowed us to scale our work immensely because everything could be run overnight. You're not having someone waiting around to manually transfer data. And so that was a really nice feature. The other thing is as our technique was evolving, similar to kind of that like train Lego example, we were able to swap out different components um, or make copies and build upon work we'd previously done. And the last thing is, um, you know, in our laboratory, we had lots of postdocs and, and lab technicians and other research scientists, and sometimes they would move on to other projects. And so having this kind of sustainable system, despite having some lab research turnover was really essential in not wasting time and repeating work um, and having it all be very clearly competent that could be looked at. So it wasn't as though we had to go back and kind of recreate something from someone who had moved on previously. We had a lot of that metadata and information saved, um, which would save us a lot of time. Um, and then I'm just gonna talk a little bit about lab automation workflows because um, Hatchim's example earlier where he said crawl, walk, run was also something we did in both automating our experiments with um, robots such like Bravos and things like that, but also in terms of automating our, our workflow. So most of the interest instruments in my lab are actually based on Windows machines. Um, so a lot of times when you do purchase an instrument, you are coupled to the particular computer it comes with because maybe the software um, that you want to run is on that computer and you're not given the ability to transfer it somewhere else. And so um, we actually, when we initially built up the lab, I bought a bunch of equipment from a third party vendor because we were testing out all this crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, we were getting these old compact computers sometimes <laughs> with these really old software. Um, but we wanted to, to kind of keep it all as we were testing everything out because what we found is it was actually less expensive for me to buy used equipment with old computers that contain the software than it was to purchase a new license of that software um, that was updated and put it on a different type of computer. So, um, so it kind of gave us this interesting flexibility where we could stitch together the computers that we had to run the instruments, but they didn't usually have a lot of space in order to store the data. And so we'd often need to run things couple of times and then have that data be transferred so that we could clear it out and run things again. 
Um, and so this problem actually created a nice opportunity for a solution where we did the automatic uploads that Hatim talked about previously, where we were essentially triggering an upload, whether it was the end of the day or after a particular experiment or at some sort of set time point, we, we ended up using GSUtil to pull the data onto the cloud. And then we also had another check and we would basically delete data off the instrument at a certain time interval and time point. And you could set up those metrics how you'd want, you know, do you want to go back and delete things from a long time ago? And before we did any sort of deletion, we actually had a comparison check run to make sure that everything was copied over um, perfectly. So um, this was a system that saved us a lot of headache and a lot of time because an experimentalist could set up an experiment, have it be run, um, go home, go enjoy their weekend and the data would be transferred and as soon as it was as it was transferred we didn't have to wait for someone to then kick off that that kind of quick check system I was just talking about we actually set it up so that it would automatically run ping the scientist when it was done so both the experimentalist and then uh, maybe one of the computational scientists um, they would look it through compare it with the metadata evaluate if this is something that we needed to continue forward with or try something else. We actually linked some of this back to our automated robots in the laboratory. So for instance, we would run certain algorithms and if we if a sample didn't hit a certain metric, we would actually trigger um, a piece of equipment to rerun something. And so that was a really interesting feature as well um, because it allowed us to gather more data rather than to completely run the whole experiment end to end. Um, things are degrading in biology. So you, you all always want to get things as, as soon as possible. So instead of having someone physically stand there and constantly check things, they could go to meetings or go to a, a research talk and it would automatically trigger another run of the experiment if there was something that maybe looked wrong. Or sometimes we just wanted multiple replicates um, if we were doing something in imaging or something like that. Um, so this was very useful. Um, people loved it eventually, but there was a bit of a mental shift um, because you always kind of want to hold on to things as much as possible. And so working together collaboratively between the experimentalists and the computational scientists really helped us to evolve a system um, that was extremely useful and very high throughput. Okay. Um, so I think at this point, we're happy to take questions. We're also happy to kind of expand on anything a bit more. You know, I know we got a bit of questions about what type of data you can utilize if you're worried about patient data and things like that. So um, Hatim, um, addressed the fact that cloud already has a lot of security controls and setup. And typically, feel free to reach out to us at any point, but typically if you're asking about, have you worked with this type of data, we, we probably most likely already have. Um, and then we have the appropriate pipeline set up to, to work with that. Um, the next question had to do with European legislations, right? So things like GDPR, data protections, PII. Um, we've been working with a lot of different research partners in Europe, in addition to the US and across the world. Um, and we, we have basically custom solutions um, that are able to address a lot of the data security concerns. Um, okay, how do you, what about concurrency? AWS Azure, yes. How do you qualify GGC fits better with life sciences, life science related data analysis? Okay. Um, so Hot Tim, he's a much faster typer than I am reader. Um, so he's published the, he put the link in there for some of the guides um, that have mentioned. Hot Tim, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, within Google Cloud, it, it's a shared responsibility model. So we have tools within cloud that enables you to build a secure environment, but it's as secure as um, as you implement it. So for example, if you have a storage bucket and you don't configure the permissions properly, then your environment is not compliant. So I've shared the link um, that has lots of the certifications like the ISOs and, and, and others, but also has guidelines to how to build, for example, a HIPAA compliant environment, uh, or an NHS compliant environment. And we have worked with multiple customers and partners to build uh, environments that got certified by different um, organizations to handle patient and clinical data. Um, regulations will be different from one country to the other. So always check with your team to make sure that you're compliant with your um, local regulations. Yeah, uh, and, and Google has an internal 
policy team um, that helps us. So if these questions come up about, you know, you're interested, can you use this particular tool? Um, and, you know, you have the regulations that you need to subscribe to. We can also have these conversations and work with you um, to see if, you know, are these other things that we've done before um, or, or what is needed to require to make adjustments. Um, okay, so. Um, I think we covered the GDPR questions. Um, is there a registry of public data sets? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so there, there is a research data and insights platform that we actually didn't talk about today. Um, so it um, allows for many public data sets, especially ones coming out of the NIH. So traditionally, and actually the NIH works very closely with cloud, and so that's been a great partnership. Um, some of those data sets in the US, because they're funded by a combination of NIH grants and then they're run at different universities, can be hosted in a bunch of different locations. And so that can make, make it sometimes difficult if you're trying to access different data. And so recently, Google Cloud put out a data research and insights platform to be able to unify that information in one particular place. Um, there's also data that's presented from things like FDA trials. Um, so that has some really interesting data as well um, that you can utilize in your research. Um, and so there has been a big effort um, made to unify that in the data research insights platform and also being expanded. We're trying to work with other partners in EMEA, um, so in Europe, in the Middle East and Africa, um, to host more and more of these types of data sets on cloud. Um, okay. Um, hybrid cloud. Um, so are you looking for a hybrid cloud approach? Um, are you moving everything to the cloud? Um, the job scheduler, private cloud. Okay, so um, Google Cloud has this great capacity to, they both support open source, uh, a lot of open source stuff, and they also are a huge supporter of hybrid cloud situations. Um, what hybrid cloud can mean to you can mean something very different to somebody else. So which particular other cloud provider you want to work with, or do you want to create something hybrid in terms of you know, uniting your on-prem resources to something in cloud. Um, so we have solutions for both. Um, and we're one of the kind of leading providers that helps to unify um, what we're offering and the things that we're uh, have strong expertise in, things like uh, machine learning, um, things like higher order data analytics, um, potentially near future is going to be things like quantum computing uh, um, with the capabilities that maybe other cloud providers are offering. So um, I would say we do offer a hybrid cloud approach. Best thing to do is actually reach out to us and describe the particular scenario that you're looking for. Um, and, and we can help kind of offer you a solution in that space. Okay. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. Kathy, can we take a couple yeah. more questions? Maybe, or? maybe, maybe um, the TA40H standard question and then we move on. That sounds great. Hatem, do you want to address yeah. the last one? Well, um, so very briefly, I think we've we've been talking about the GA for GH standards at Google for quite some time. We already have people um, at Google, principal engineers who are members of the GA for GH um, uh, committees, steering committees. Um, there is um, already an open source implementation for integrating Google Cloud identity with uh, the GA for GH identity standard, and I know that there are some efforts as well for uh, the data store. Um, Nothing yet on 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 a solid uh, roadmap that I can share, but it's definitely something that we are looking at and and thinking about. Okay, fabulous. Then thank you very much to the both of you for your introductory talk. Um, and um, I, I guess the amount of questions came in make it clear that it was a very interesting topic. And I think um, we're just taking the discussion now into our panel discussion. So. Um, on our panel, we of course will have Hatim and Annalisa, and um, we also have Dirk from the company called Biostrand. I think you're based in Belgium, if I'm not mistaken. Indeed. And then, yeah, fabulous. And then we have Claire um, from the EBI. And um, I'll just invite both of you to quickly introduce yourselves so everyone knows where you're coming from, what your background is, and then we move on into the panel discussion. So, um, Dirk, do you want to make a start? 
So that's fine. So thanks, Katarina. Uh, don't know if you have the two slides. Uh, um, uh, I can, I, yeah, I can share them from my screen if you prefer that. Let me quickly do that. Perfect. So um, I'm Dirk. I've studied medicine. Uh, did also the specialization of psychiatry. So I'm a psychiatrist and did my PhD in medical artificial intelligence, building reasoning systems and expert systems. And so in the year 2000, I started my first company around NLP, natural language processing. And so my first company was acquired in 2010 by US-based database provider. And so um, then a couple of years later, I really made a discovery. I found in uh, genetic data, so in omics data, uh, really very specific uh, patterns and kind of signature sequences that are very, very specific for certain structures, functions, and positions. And these patterns, they are uh, at the three different omics layers. So both at the DNA, RNA, and amino acid uh, layer. And that is, let's say, the core of our technology. And you can see in the uh, next slide, based on this uh, HIFT patterns, and we have mined all these HIFT patterns in all the, uh, the whole biosphere, so in whatever exists on Earth, uh, again, at the, uh, the three different uh, levels. And based with these patterns, you can really easily build uh, also, for instance, pangenomic graphs that immediately integrate the DNA, RNA, and amino acid level, and that are very specific, that contain very specific information for sequencing, for sequencing function and 3D structure. And that gives also a shift in, in paradigm. That means, uh, well, instead of having to use this uh, dynamic programming and so on, we really could convert, let's say, the omics data analysis in an call it a Google-like indexing principle, and that you can start using pattern recognition approach to do this uh, omics search and data analysis. So that's uh, where BioStand uh, stands for. Fabulous. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, great. So Claire, do you want to share your own screen or? Yeah, it's fine. Um, I'm just opening it. Claire and I normally sit in the same building, but um, I guess we both haven't been for over a year now. <laughs> yep, I haven't been back. <laughs> can, can you see the screen? Um, no, not yet. Okay, one second. Okay. Yes. Now? Oh, now we can, yeah. Okay. So my name is Claire Donovan. I'm head of metabolomics at Embly ABI. Um, so I'm a database provider of omics data. And um, as you've heard in the presentations, people are really getting a hold on genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. But metabolites are the next big thing, basically, because um, the metabolites are they represent the downstream biochemical end products. You can predict things from the genes and the proteins of what they actually do, but they are subject to controls within the body. So the actual confirmation of the phenotype is right at the metabolomic profiles. And this is why people still do blood tests to summarize. So um, what's important to realize about the metabolomics field is that it's exploding right now. So if you look at our growth since 2017, we have grown, uh, it, it was originally set up in 2012 and it was really small and now it's just growing and growing. The other important thing to realize is that all of that data since 2017, half the database is now human and mouse. This is the real focus of metabolomics as it's moving into the clinical world. And we are a global database. Our biggest submitters are, believe it or not, China and the United States, uh, with the UK coming um, behind as the third person and then various European countries, but we are a global resource. So why does this matter in this context? We have very different kinds of submitters. We have the scientist in the lab 
who doesn't have GDPR things to worry about. They're doing research. They want to publish a paper. They pop it in Metabolites and the journals are happy and we curate it and it's all lovely. But we also have companies. So we have pipelines with Metabolon where they sell the metabolomics tests uh, and the processing. We have phenome centers in the UK and in the States. And we also have uh, users who want to do clinical data. Some of it is already there, but we are also investigating controlled access along the lines of EGA that some of you might be familiar with. Um, but our experience of cloud, a few years ago, we did try to create an environment, but I think certain European countries, it was funded by the European Union, um, certain countries were still not comfortable about putting things in the cloud that can move on. But what we're learning right now when we're talking about controlled access is that they want a copy of metabolites locally in their country where they can put in the data um, in the same standards as uh, we follow across the world. And so then they can share as they feel comfortable. So it's more, maybe the cloud option there could be the discovery model. So you have the list of the resources and if they're available to use, you can upload them and analyze them in the cloud. The other one who's very much, we're discussing this with right now, is the UK Biobank because they're pushing into metabolomics and proteomics. Um, that work is ongoing at the moment for metabolomics The Nightingale and Metabolome companies are working with them. So we're working with them on standards and they are also discussing putting this data on the cloud. So that's why I'm here. I hope that helps. And metabolomics is even more scary than proteomics, just so you know. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can take some of that scariness away today. Um, great. Then, um, Claire, if you stop sharing, I thought um, before we dive into the discussion, we just have a, a look at who's actually in the audience today, which will maybe help um, kind of direct the discussion a bit. So. Um, in the Mentimeter question, we've asked actually the audience, which of these um, is true for them to find out what kind of background they have. And um, I think you can all see my screen now. So most of the people in the audience work as researchers in academia on the multi-omics project. We've got some from industry, and we have people that work for software providers um, for multi-omics analysis. It's quite interesting. And then um, we have people that work for cloud providers and um, work for database providers and a lot of other people who probably came along because they are interested in the topic. Okay, let's see. So um, the next question actually that we've asked in the Mentimeter is if you're currently using the cloud for your analysis. So, um, it's interesting to see that a lot of people have not used the cloud for their analysis um, yet. So maybe um, let's start our discussion with what, 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 what do you perceive as the biggest bottlenecks um, to, for, for cloud adoption actually um, when doing multi-omics analysis? Um, maybe we start um, with you, Claire. Is it scary? <laughs> I think the, the issue is um, for our amount of data, uh, uh, metabolomics experiments produce a whole whack of mass spectrometry data and uh, things can be terabytes big and that's just a, a small sample. So it, in theory, it's perfect to use the cloud for that because most people don't have local resources for it. The biggest challenge is, as I mentioned in the introduction is the actual permission to let the data leave uh, the hospital or the country, even the hospital, um, or to leave the country. And that's why I was quite excited to hear that Annalisa and Hetem, that they've been working with the NIH or with the NHS to get permissions for this kind of thing. So I would like to hear more about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, maybe, Dirk, we proceed with you. Um, you um, run a smaller company um, 
and you probably interact quite closely with people who are interested in in using cloud approach as well so what is your take on that yeah well indeed and so uh, well at this moment we have implemented our platform well not on a google platform but on another uh, player but we can easily uh, change or transfer this uh, to um, different uh, cloud providers or even install this on on premise and what we really see is also we try to avoid implementations on premise uh, because that's a lot of hassle, uh, extra work that not always is easy to also maintain the system and so on. So we really promote also using this type of analysis on, on cloud platforms. Cloud platforms. That's definitely the way to to go. And so um, I'm very yeah fond of uh, this this approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe Hatim or Annalisa. Um, you can maybe talk a little bit about the kind of customer feedback you have received. Why are many people apprehensive and, and what, what could be the solutions to that? Um, sure, so I, I can go first briefly. Um, so we see, so if you have a situation where you've been able to get away with doing stuff on-prem, <laughs> now there is this then bridge you need to cross in order to kind of go to cloud and um you know with an experimentalist perspective sometimes there's this hesitancy because um on-prem is right there it's available it seems as though it's free because <laughs> your institute has a huge group of people supporting it that um that maybe you don't realize and it, it's working now right and there is a bit of um transition which is why we recommend this crawl walk run approach to transferring your stuff over and being able to either transfer the open source software that you're already utilizing or maybe kind of building your own software with the cloud AI notebooks or another different platform that you're interested in um, to do that work. And so sometimes it's easier just to solve things right now and deal with the slow um, pipelines or the kind of, you know, you're constantly deleting raw data, uh, hoping that you don't need to have it later, then making that transition. And, and so, you know, we're here to kind of help you and guide you along that way. Um, and I know even in my lab where we had access to all of Google's resources, there was still this um, desire to kind of cling to a process that's known versus a process that maybe feels a little bit different. Um, but once people made that transition, they realized that they could do a lot more than they initially could. So as Claire mentioned, they were able to look at data sets that maybe you weren't able, you had to, you couldn't look at the entire terabyte of data. You had to maybe talk, take the top 10% and just analyze that and hope that the distribution from that um, reflected the distribution of the entire data set. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so that's one thing. Um, Hatim, did you wanna maybe add? No, I, I, I think it's 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 the change in in the process. That's one thing. There is there is also data gravity in terms of sometimes there is lots of data on prem and 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 uh, people sometimes get worried about moving um, this amount of data to uh, to cloud. Um, it could be for a regulatory reason. It could be that they simply um, don't understand how to secure the data on cloud. But this is why I think working together with uh, with a cloud provider like Google Cloud and working with a partner enables you to establish these processes and how to actually move to cloud. And also the other thing we hear quite often is uh, we worried about runaway costs. What if we spend too much money on cloud? But again, there are tools um, that are built into um, cloud. And as I explained, um, it's you need to start, understand exactly what you're going to do on cloud and then make sure that you only use the resources that you need and then shut everything down. So there is a um, a change in the mindset on how you access resources, um, how you manage these resources and how you secure them. You're moving from an on-prem where everything is secure and everything, at least sometimes from the point of view of researcher is free to a, a different world. So you need to just um, 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 uh, educate yourself and your team and, and change. But once you do that, then the opportunities that open to you is unlimited. As, as I said before, and this is one of my favorite examples, uh, one of the universities we work with um, did a GWAS on 200,000 uh, genome sequences in under a week because they burst into 100,000 cores on Google Cloud. So it's this ability to go quickly to results, to generate results quickly, um, and then actually spend your time looking into the data, combing through it and finding new, um, um, uh, new findings. 
Okay, thank you very much. So now let's have a look what actually our audience thinks are the biggest constraints to transitioning to cloud-based analysis. Um, this might take a little bit longer because people have to actually type text, but um, we will see if that confirms all that you've uh, just mentioned. Um, until we get the results, I know Bjorn, you wanted to ask a, quest a specific question, so maybe you can just unmute now and, and ask your question to the panel. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, Hetem um, mentioned that uh, surprisingly in a positive context. So I'm a little bit worried about data gravity, to be honest. Um, what we see in the US is that the big cloud providers are hosting a lot of data. And you um, emphasize that in your talk, right, that you're hosting the thousand genome project, TCGA data sets, and so on. Um, the problem is that these are all attached to egress fees, right? So if I want to access it from outside of your cloud, it gets very costly actually for us to, um, to use that data um, and to make science with it. So even worse, there are different cloud providers offering different data sets like Azure have different data sets and then Google Cloud. So even if I want to run in your Google Cloud some analyzers, I probably need to pay to different cloud providers egress fees to get that actually crunched in the Google Cloud and vice versa. So my question is a little bit, how do we prevent here lock-in effects so that we lock in scientists in a specific cloud to a specific vendor um, and then lose control over that? Um, I know that the NIH that you also mentioned, um, yeah, are discussing currently how to prevent that. And they see that also as a problem. So how do we prevent that in Europe that we have a similar um, effect and that data gravity is actually um, yeah, playing us a trick and lock us in into some cloud provider? Yeah, Hatim, if you could maybe follow up on that quickly. Yeah, this is this is actually a very um, tricky issue, and I I agree with you that that egress charges specifically for this type of data is 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 causing an issue at the moment. NIH I know is is hosting a copy on both um, Google Cloud and AWS, and uh, but also I have to add that for example our open um, uh, our public data set um, uh, sets are available without egress charges, so not all of the data sets are hosted and actually. Uh, you need to pay egress um, for the charges. Um, um, for some of the privately hosted data sets, um, sometimes the uh, private organization chooses to use what we call um, um, uh, requester pay. So in this case, yes, people are asking the data sets would have to pay, but this is not always the case. I do recognize how this could be an issue, um, but also on the other side, if you look and you mentioned, for example, TCGA is an example. Also, having 2,000 copies of TCGA in different institutes is not the answer. I, I don't have an answer yet for this problem. It's a challenge. Um, sometimes you, you, it's cheaper to process the data where it resides. Sometimes it's, it makes sense to actually download a whole copy. And it does cost money, but um, it's, it's the current reality. But it's something I agree with you that we'll need addressing sometime. Thank you, Hatim. Actually, um, following up from that, Dirk, maybe from your perspective as a, as, as a smaller company as um, Google, I guess you probably um, have to worry about um, kind of costs as well. Um, maybe you could discuss, because I guess looking at the, at the answers that came in from the audience, a lot of it has to do with, with costs, unpredictability of costs, um, yeah, so may maybe you could discuss a little bit the cost side of, of running. Yeah. Well, program. that's of course an, an important uh, aspect and especially uh, the, the huge amount of data that you've, we are all crushing, especially in this omics, uh, let's say domain. And that's also why we have focused on, okay, what is the, the right way to um, validate, uh, let's say the cost part of it. And so um, what we see at least with, with our approach in um, using this HIFT pattern so that we can um, do 
all the omics data analysis really in a reduced cost. So we um, don't need that much computational power. So we are um, not, uh, let's say, that um, having that variability on uh, processing power. So that is also why we could uh, more scale or price models related to the data size. So that uh, also customers really know in advance, okay, that's the amount of data, that's the size, and that will cost me, uh, let's say, that amount of money to process the data. So uh, yeah, we try to be also inventive on, on, on that aspect of cost, but that's real um, a very important part. And also um, yeah, when people want to store their proprietary data, because we can compare also, or we have indexed, uh, let's say open source data, but also customers can uh, load their own um, proprietary data and then also start comparing that with open source data. So there also we need to have a good way to um, yeah, have a nice uh, and transparent uh, cost model. Thank you. Um, looking through all those answers, a lot of the answers that came in have to do with training, awareness, um, and Claire, maybe since the EBI has a, has a huge training program as well, do you think um, we're doing enough on, on training people on how to do um, these kind of multi-omics analysis in the cloud and um, what can we do to enhance innovation in that sector? How do we go about um, raising awareness and training people? Well, actually, um, I see that Stephen Newhouse is also on the call. <laughs> <coughs> And so we have a cloud in, in SAP EBI, which is called <coughs> Embassy. And we did use it. And we had a couple of tutorials <coughs> online at the time of that project I referred to earlier. And a lot of people still look at those resources because I get the statistics every month. So there is a demand for training, but the, it needs to be kept up to date and we don't make the embassy cloud available through um, phenomenal anymore because the project is finished. But I would call on uh, Stephen to address the training that his team are giving people internally, because even within the EBI, we have people moving onto the cloud. You referred to the imaging, a single cell imaging earlier. So we have teams working on that. And so they needed to get up to speed and it was Stephen's team who trained them. Mm -hmm. So um, Stephen is on the call, maybe he wants to quickly um, come in and, and answer that. And actually maybe looking into the kind of um, training that is or like the education that is provided at universities, um, are, are we already seeing this being lectured at university? I don't know, Stephen, if you're on the call. Yes, thank you, Claire. Um, so we have uh, done a number of uh, trainings in basic um, containerized deployment, and you know, because that was seen as, as part of the EOSC Life project, because that was seen as being a, a big important blocker for some of the projects that were involved in that. Uh, that information is uh, publicly available uh, and is now set up as a self-paced course, and there's now a um, the second uh, course on more advanced yeah. Kubernetes and container management that's been done by our, our colleagues uh, in Germany through uh, Denby uh, and the, uh, the Elixir node there. Uh, more broadly, there is a lot of excellent online content that's available either for free or through uh, providers such as Coursera. Uh, and of the uh, the major cloud providers such as Google and Amazon, who have both sort of safe self-paced training and obviously access to uh, uh, commercial training courses to gain uh, relevant certification. So there's there is no um, no shortage of material for both for free and uh, for paid for use if you if you want to find it. So maybe maybe um, if you have available, if you could paste the links into the chat box, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Actually, for the people um, on the panel who work in the private sector, do you actually perceive that there is a, a skill gap, that um, there is a lot of training that needs to be done? The people you recruit, are they, are they able to, to um, work 
um, or do you have to train them on the project? Yeah, we definitely have to train them on, on specific projects uh, uh, because, yeah, I think uh, also biofermentations, they are um, not widely available. So that means also quite a lot of data scientists uh, from different backgrounds uh, are in not only in our companies, but uh, in, in let's say most of the startup companies working in this field. So that means uh, people with, from instance, uh, as, uh, more um, uh, mathematic background or other science background, yeah, we need to train them and to on, also help to understand the, let's say the, the basics of uh, biology. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that's a part of the job. Also, if you want to start up uh, or set up a, a company, so indeed training is uh, an important part, but also that the fact that this omics uh, analysis is really very multidisciplinary. And so you really need to uh, have uh, in your team uh, patients who, um, persons who have knowledge about the uh, computational uh, point of view of the project, but also from the biological point of view. And so having such multidisciplinary team um, well, that is, of course, also needs some, some training and, um, yeah, some extra attention. Um, Hatim, did you want to add anything or Annalisa? Yeah, um, just similar to, to what Stephen said, in terms of um, uh, we as a cloud provider, and I'm sure others as well, we do offer lots of free training. So um, I just pasted one link. I'm going to paste another link now as well. Uh, to some of the resources that people have aligned. So um, um, in, in addition to, to this free training, what we have seen actually work in organization is, is building in-house um, training and champions program. So actually having um, um, uh, people who would be champions of change, um, who would be more interested in actually learning and, and teaching and supporting others is key to the whole organization um, uh, uh, success. So um, I will paste some additional resources uh, to the chat. But as I said, having um, a deliberate um, in-house uh, knowledge sharing program is actually key uh, to this. Um, lot, lots of the knowledge is transferable. Um, so people can actually take this knowledge usually from one cloud to the other, which, which does help. So, um, and as I said, there is lots of free resources online that I think people are not taking enough advantage of. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I would also point out like with Google Cloud, we've actually participated with some research institutes towards um, grant applications and helping to build up. Um, there was a single cell RNA sequencing um, contribution that we were trying to contribute some of the expertise internally to because um, as as mentioned, a lot of this stuff is novel and custom. It's not in the genomic space anymore where there's a lot of information. It's, you know, the metabolomic space, it's very complex, it's different. The way you wanna think about the data is very different as well. Um, and so, you know, if there's opportunities for us to come and talk about this type of work, um, actually Google Cloud really supports and advocates for that. Um, so check out what's available online, but also feel free to reach out to us um, and connect um, because that is something that we, we do as part of our job is, is lend internal expertise to help build up um, programming and, and more training. Fabulous, thank you very much. Um, Claire, maybe I go with you next. Um, in terms of public-private partnerships, where do you think are the biggest opportunities in that space, and um, and where will we, where do we have to work together to see, you know, the biggest new innovations coming out of in in that field? Well, it, it I would like to highlight. I mentioned it in passing. Uh, we do work with service providers, so a lot of people, especially in the clinical metabolomics they send the samples off to a company for processing. They don't actually process them themselves. And traditionally, all they got back was um, an Excel spreadsheet saying, this is what we saw in the samples you sent us. And that was lovely because that's all they needed, but they didn't get their raw data back. So when they were trying to do uh, longitudinal studies, it became more of an issue. Um, 
now companies are beginning to work with us. Metabolon actually submits the raw data to us in a derived file format, not the raw, raw data, but most people don't have the proprietary software to manipulate the raw, raw data in the first place. So it was already a major step forward. We are in discussions with Biocrates and Nightingale as well. And so I really feel that there is so much opportunity to develop like we're a research institute. We, we put all the data out there for everyone to use. Um, the companies can do the um, experimental work and send it on to us. So that's what we have a pipeline and it really works. They get paid and we make our data public for everybody to use and to move the science on. And I think there'll be a lot of that going on in the future. I think the other nice components that we have seen so much because I originally come from the protein world is how many companies, both pharmaceutical and um, biotech use the data that's available in resources such as NCBI and EBI to do their own science, such as the open targets. So I'm hoping to be include the metabolomics data to be in the next round of open targets call because we now have so much data, human data, it's actually relevant for their um, biomarker discovery. So there, there is a lot of potential. The barrier, the only issue right now is that a lot of people who are trying to use this data, they have um, a biological background, but not so much an analytical chemistry one. And um, for those of you who, ever did anything like chemistry, it's quite different <laughs> to uh, biology. And a lot of people find it challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, again, a process of training. So one of our most popular courses is uh, Introduction to Metabolomics Analysis. Um, and that's aimed at biologists, clinicians, people who have no background whatsoever in chemistry to try and get their head around what kind of data they're dealing with and how it relates to concepts they already know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dirk, maybe yeah. we, we follow on with you. Where, where do you see the biggest potential? Where do we need to work more closely together um, across the... Well, I, I think it, that's a really important, let's say, to have a good interaction and also with this public organizations that are um, uh, giving, let's say, all this data uh, that you can use to start your experiments and, and to, to build on uh, uh, even new applications. And even in the case of BioStrand, when I started uh, my company, we started mining all the public available data for the specific patterns. So I really have to say thanks to this public available data that we could build uh, or, or uh, knowledge base. Uh, so it's, it's very important. And also what I want to, to stress, and for me, that was really a surprise because again, I came from a background where working with healthcare data and um, there I really found it very difficult to, to get the hands on, on healthcare data. For instance, if you want to build uh, predictive models like sepsis or whatever, well, if you start such a project, then you have to wait, let's say six to nine months just to arrange everything and to make sure that you could collaborate with, for instance, a hospital to get your hands on, on such kind of data. And on the other hand, like say with this omics data, genomics data, proteomics data, even the metabolomics data, well, it's so massive, but it's also so easy available. So I'm um, really very, um, yeah, proud that that exists and I'm, yeah, uh, very fond of it. So uh, it can really help startups and companies to, yeah, to move on and to build very nice applications. Thank you. Um, that, that's, of course, great for, for um, organizations like the EBI and for, for Alex to be here. Um, and Annalisa Hatim, maybe you can both give a comment on that as well. And um, I also moved uh, Menti on um, because I would be actually quite interested to hear from the audience as well what kind of um, data resources they use in their working models. And how it's there. Sure, I can speak. Sorry, there was a, there's 
been a bit of background, but I'm hoping I've maybe been there's... trying to figure out where it comes from. <laughs> I'm, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm from everywhere. There's always a little chaos in the world. Um, so um, I think in terms of unification, um, the most prominent things are some of the things we've touched upon here, right? So the ability to build up this educational resource space. Um, so we're actually working on this both from the quantum computing side and also from the life sciences side that there's a huge need for creating kind of these educational pipelines for um, both having computational anal analysis skills plus the molecular biology or um, bio chemistry or organic chemistry background and how to unify the two um, into kind of a extractable production way. Um, so that's something that I think we can come together on because, you know, we're both interested in finding these and understanding these biological mechanisms. Um, and another area that was touched on for unification is the the hosting of data sets. So actually, Claire, I know you brought this up very early on and we didn't get to it, but um, we would love to also host stuff from EBI. I think we've reached out, um, but we can talk offline. Um, but creating that in a way that's sustainable, right? You know, so cloud services do cost money, um, but how do you make it in a way that's sustainable for researchers without a lock-in um, so that they can access the data sets that they need? Um, and multi-omics, this is especially an interesting question because typically you need genomics data sets, transcriptomics data sets, maybe your proteomics data sets, your metabolomics data sets, you need some imaging data sets. So it's not only that the data sets are getting larger, but the number of types of ways that you're looking at the problem is also getting bigger. And so how do we build a sustainable ecosystem um, for researchers such that they have access to everything they need in a very simplistic way without having to pay a bunch of different providers or having to kind of have some redundancy in that system. And I think um, getting input from both sides and that perspective is a way where we could work together on things. Um, and then the third area is actually, you know, Microsoft has an excellent research center. Google has a research center. Um, Amazon is getting a lot of interest in doing research as well, both in traditional computational spaces, but also in the life sciences, in biotechnology, um, there's, so th there's this opportunity for research collaboration. And actually at Google, we host faculty, um, we built postdoc programs, we have lab technicians there, um, we do tons of collaboration. So th that direct research interaction is another space because um, there are things that maybe Google is good at that they can offer um, to help with some of the research problems that are trying to be solved and, and working together. So I'd say those are my top three things for what we could get out of working together. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I'm a bit co conscious of time. Um, so Hatim, if you have like one one more sentence to okay, add. Yeah, if I, if I say one, if I have one sentence to add, uh, I think there is um, um, a community effort and I see it a lot which is when a data set is published, is how to publish some basic best practices and some basic pipelines on how to use this specific data wherever it is hosted, whether it's hosted on Ensemble or it's hosted on a cloud provider or hosted in a specific repository. So publishing these samples and these cookbooks sometimes or recipes um, is extremely important. Um, and I see an increasing trend of, of doing just that. So, it, but this, it just needs to be, to keep going and grow even more. Thank you. Um, so maybe just to finish off, we can have a look at um, the responses that came back from the audience. Um, it seems Ensemble seems seems to be the winner in, in uh, terms of open databases that um, are used, um, at least from people on the call. Um, so thank you very much. Um, really great that um, you all came today to listen to our first Alexi Bioinformatics Industry Forum virtual event this year. Thank you very much to all the panelists and speakers today, Dirk, Claire, Hatim, and Annalisa. And I guess if people want to reach out to you afterwards, um, they should just do that via email. Um, we will make the recording available on our YouTube channel. And um, yeah, the only thing left for me to say is thank you very much for taking the time. And I hope we'll see you in the future at um, any of our other Alexi Bioinformatics Industry Forum events. So thank you very much again. And